Listen to somebody giving a talk about homelessness and check your ideas. Good evening. I'm so pleased that so many people have attended my talk. I know many of you are concerned about the number of homeless people that there are in the town centre. I know a lot of you will feel that the situation is becoming worse and that nobody is doing anything about it. However, I think that coming along this evening shows that you want to know more about homelessness and understand the issue and not simply see it as a problem that affects you as individuals. Now, I'll start by explaining what homeless means, and it means a little more than simply sleeping out in the street. The people you see in parks and gardens or bus stops and shop doorways are a small percentage of the people that we class as homeless. People are homeless if they are sleeping on the floor or on the sofa at a friend's house. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a hostel or shelter for homeless people. They are homeless if they are sleeping in a car or any other vehicle. We also class people as homeless if they are separated from family or other people that they would normally live with. People are homeless if they live in conditions that are so bad that their health is affected, and they are homeless if they are in danger of violence or physical abuse. That means, as I said before, that homelessness is a much bigger issue than a few people sleeping in bus stops or shop doorways. This is just what you see. So why do people become homeless? People do not choose to be homeless. They are not sleeping rough because they have chosen to leave a safe home or families who love them. They are homeless because there is no other option. People become homeless because they are poor, because they cannot afford to pay rent, or sometimes because they cannot afford to pay the mortgage on a house or apartment that they have bought. People become homeless because they lose their job. Or have never had a job. There are related problems that often result in a person becoming homeless. Many homeless people have a drug addiction. They are either homeless because they spend their money on drugs, or they have become addicted to drugs because they are homeless. A high percentage of homeless people have mental health problems and find it difficult to make the decisions about their lives that most people can make. A number of homeless people are ex-prisoners. When they are released from prison, it is very difficult to find a job and a place to live. Many people become homeless because the owner of their home, a landlord or landlady, evicts them. If people have lived in the same place for a long time and then suddenly lose it, they can find it impossible to afford the increased rent for a new home. Many people have to move out of the place they live because it is dangerous. A young person may have a violent father or a wife a violent husband. These people are too afraid to stay in their home, and they risk making themselves homeless. Finally, in many parts of the country, there is just not enough housing, certainly not enough housing that poor people can afford. The increase in the value of property has made life difficult for many people, not just homeless people. I'm sure many of you will understand that. So, how do we deal with a problem as big as this? It isn't easy. In this country, people with very poorly paid jobs or no jobs at all receive some kind of financial support. In some cases, all or part of their rent is paid by the government. This helps to stop people becoming homeless. But if you are already homeless, it doesn't help. Most towns, like this one, have shelters for people who are temporarily homeless, but they cannot stay at them permanently. They have to move on after a certain period of time. Some towns have food kitchens where homeless people can get a meal two or three times a week. The problem is that shelters and food kitchens don't really deal with the cause of the problem; they deal only with the effect. People can stay in a shelter for a while. But it will not help them to find a home of their own, and that is what they need, of course. Now, I'm going to go on in a moment to talk about some of the suggestions that have been made in terms of dealing with homelessness, ideas for dealing with the problem in a more permanent way. I'll also talk about some of the programs that are in place and are, in some cases, very successful in other parts of the world. 
Before that, does anyone have any questions about what I have said so far? Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear the general manager of a golf club talking to some people who would like to become members. First, you will have time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to this meeting. Demand for membership places has far exceeded our expectations this year. So it was decided to gather you all here together to go through the process step by step, once rather than many times with each of you individually. The first thing you need to do is not fill in the application form. This, you see, is a waste of time unless you have found an application sponsor. Your sponsor must be an existing full member of the club. Now, once you have your sponsor, you should log on to our website and fill in and send through the membership form. You will be prompted to provide the relevant deposit at the same time as you submit your application. You may do so using any major debit or credit card. The next step is for you to attend a general meeting of the club. There are typically meetings held once a month. After the club meeting, you will then be required to wait a while in order for the club committee to examine and, if all is in order, approve your application. It may be necessary to ask you to come forward for an additional interview before approval is granted, depending on the circumstances. Now, once you have been approved, you are almost a member of the club. All you need to do then. Is pay the remaining balance of your membership fee. Having done this, you are officially a member of Blaine Row Golf Club. However, you cannot start to play in competitions until you have acquired your handicap. In order to do this, you must send in three cards. The committee will then issue you with a club handicap within seven days. On the basis of how you performed in each of the three rounds you played. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. No, I won't spend much more than a few minutes on this, but let's go through the different membership types、uh, quickly now. Remember. All the information I am about to give you and more is available on our website. The first category is full ordinary member. Basically, this is a full membership that gives you full playing rights during competitions, and for casual golf as well. It costs ten thousand pounds to become a full member, or alternatively, four instalments of two thousand five hundred pounds. Our next category is associate. This is for a golfer who is already a member of a club, but wants to join ours too, while keeping his existing club as his main club. You have the same rights as a full member, but the cost is nine thousand pounds. I must remind you that there is a limited number of memberships of this kind available. Five-day members pay five thousand pounds to join, and this payment can be put towards becoming a full member at a later date if you would like to upgrade your membership status. You enjoy full playing rights during casual play, and can play in all weekday competitions. However, you cannot enter competitions at the weekend. Intermediate membership. Is open to golfers under the age of 25, and costs 1,800 pounds, as do the other remaining membership types: junior, senior, and overseas. If you are an intermediate member, you too have full playing rights for casual play. However, you can only play in competition if a full member of the club invites you to join him. Junior members are aged between twelve and eighteen. 
They enjoy restricted playing rights in casual playing time, and are only allowed to play on Monday and Wednesday mornings. They can occasionally play in competitions, but the opportunities to play in this format are severely restricted. Senior members enjoy full rights at all times, and overseas members can play on the course casually at any time, and can enter competitions if invited to do so by a full member of the club. Now, as to the questions of, that's the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. You will hear an interview with Dr. Simons. Now you have some time to read questions twenty-one to thirty. As you listen, complete the sentences by writing no more than three words for each answer. Well, as I said, there were three areas of interest, so perhaps we should take each in turn. Fine. Let's take the medical and physical evidence first. Hmm. Well, first of all, life expectancy. Although some very old individuals were encountered, the Ramesses is a case in point. He was probably over ninety. It seemed the average Egyptian died rather young, from about thirty to thirty-five years old on the whole. Although the nobility, as might be expected, tended to live longer, some of them have been found to be fifty or sixty years old. Well, naturally. The older they got, the more medical problems were encountered. But some modern disorders have so far not been found. There is no evidence yet of any malignant tumours, for example. Although the fact that most people studied were comparatively young could account for this. Another modern problem, dental decay, was also absent, probably due to the plain diet and absence of sugar. There was another problem with teeth. Caused by this diet, the stones on which their flour was ground caused a lot of grit to get into the bread, and this eroded the teeth so much that many older people must have suffered greatly and could have been confined to a liquid diet. An abscess on the jaw caused by this kind of erosion may, in fact, have contributed to the death of Ramesses the Second. Analysis of the internal organs of several mummies has revealed that intestinal parasites were common, even among the upper classes. Evidence of a generally low standard of public hygiene and another widespread disorder was a form of anemia. Naturally, the ancient Egyptians didn't smoke, but、uh, lesions on the lung were widespread. These, however, Of the sort that we associate today with workers in mines and quarries, and must be due, in the case of Egyptians, to living in sandy desert conditions. Actually, on the smoking issue, there was a temporary sensation when traces of what appeared to be tobacco were found in Ramesses's sarcophagus. But、uh, botanists later confirmed that it was not, in fact, tobacco itself, but a related plant which is native to Egypt. In the meantime. Cynics were commenting that it probably had come from the cigarette of some careless Egyptologist or museum attendant of the past. Ha ha! And what about their physical appearance? Well, what would you expect from seeing Egyptian art? They were light and slight in build. The average height for both men and women was about one meter sixty. And、um, studies of the skeletons from which the covering of flesh can be extrapolated suggest that they weighed much less in relation to their height than most modern people, from about ten to fifteen kilograms, less than someone of a similar height today is the estimate. And what about mummification? Ah,、uh, well, the first thing to be said is that it wasn't always done in the same way. And it was by no means infallible, as many people tend to think. Many bodies, including that of the famous King Tutankhamun, were also entirely destroyed by overuse of one or another of the substances generally employed. The basic procedure was much the same, however. Most of the internal organs, including the brain, were removed and preserved separately in a jar. The brain was got out through the nose using a sort of hook. Oh dear! Yes. It used to be thought that the heart was always removed too, but in the case of Ramesses, it was found in place. The body was then immersed in a substance called natron. That's a form of sodium carbonate, which occurred naturally in Egypt, for forty to seventy days. It was then washed, made up, and wrapped in linen bandages and placed in its coffin or sarcophagus. Then it was soaked in oils, resins, and perfumes to help preserve it further. 
You said the body was made up. Do you mean its face was painted? Yes, yes. Ramesses was not only made up; they had to restructure his nose, which was damaged when they took out his brain. The investigators found that it had been stuffed with small animal bones and、uh, peppercorns of all things. His hair had been dyed too. You said that Ramesses had suffered other adventures after his death. Ah, well, yes, poor chap. Well, for a start, he was found in a much later tomb than his real date. Along with a lot of other pharaohs, it looks very much as if the priests of later times had moved and reburied him to save him from tomb robbers. His body was transported, along with the other pharaohs found in the same tomb, to the Cairo Museum. That was in 1871, and it was put on display. Well, naturally, removed from the dry desert atmosphere, his body started to deteriorate, and by the 1970s was in very poor state. That was part of the reason why the Egyptian authorities gave their consent for its temporary removal to Paris for study. Yet another upheaval. The French experts aim not only to carry out an investigation, but were also able to apply the latest techniques of restoration and conservation. So that at the end of the study, Ramesses was specially treated and then rewrapped in new bandages. Well, they weren't exactly new, since they were of ancient Egyptian date. Given a new sarcophagus and carefully transported back to Cairo, where he is now kept in a controlled environment, which should slow down the deterioration process. So, as I said at the beginning, not only was science served, but a proper respect was paid to the remains in the end. Exactly. That is the end of section three. You will have half a minute to check your answers. Section four. You are going to hear a lecture on fishing. First, look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. As you can see, there are four alternative answers. A. B, C, and D for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer, and circle the correct letter. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr. North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University, and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view. And also on attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe, and in particular the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list, a few relevant articles, and a copy of this lecture on the department website. A statistic to begin with: since the 1970s. Stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen on average by ninety percent. And why has this happened? Well, there's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate, with efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology-driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence. Many fishing stocks in the European waters, from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters; it's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example, are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology. And there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish, and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing, for example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom, where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich. People have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat. Driving up demand and depleting stocks, food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat, which again is invariably replaced by fish. Before the speaker continues, look at questions thirty-seven to forty. As you listen, complete the table. Write no more than three words 
for each answer. Another important reason is that a sizable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas, like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish, which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing. So the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe, like Spain, rely heavily on fishing, and are naturally against any step which restricts their catch. But if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod from the Great Banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic. After a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which it was hoped would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return. And many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale. Now, if you look at this table on the screen, you can see. That's the end of section four.